I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. We have Larry with us today. Larry, how are you doing? Doing great, doing great. Uh, Brian and Tom, fellas, how are you doing? Pretty good. Very good, thank you. Well, Larry, usually I'll just give you the microphone, and then um, you know we have we have questions as we go. We'll go into that, but go ahead and tell us what happened. Well, I'll just kind of break it down here. Uh, my name's Larry. Uh, I've been in the military. Uh, I'm uh, 50 years old. Uh, I've had 40 years basically of uh, outdoor experience, hunting and fishing. Um, most of my skills have been honed around the military and and the outdoors. I've had four different encounters throughout my 40 plus years. I guess the first one will start when I was five years old. Um, it was in Wembley, Texas, which is right outside of Comel County, Texas. Uh, I was around five years old. Uh, my grandfather owned a small ranch that we uh, did a lot of deer hunting on. Um, I was hunting with my mother on a small ground blind that we had made, I guess, about 500 yards from the main cabin. On that evening day, uh, we were in the uh, ground blind, and my mother was hunting, uh, facing towards the feeder, and I, of course, at five years old, was running all over the place inside the ground blind. And uh, about 20 minutes before dark, I remember turning around, and I saw this large creature standing Oh, I guess today it was about 20 or 30 yards behind us in some pinion oak trees just staring at us. And I was telling my mom, I said, Mom, there's a hairy man looking at us. And she said, oh, honey, you know, be quiet. We're hunting. You don't want to scare the deer. And I said, no, but, Mom, there's a hairy man that's looking at us. Well, she blew it off. Uh, she made me sit back down. And I remember popping back up about two or three minutes later, turning around, and he was gone. Um to that day, uh, we had a few problems with break-ins and stuff at, in our main cabin, and the only thing they ever took out of there was food out of our freezer that we had. We kept venison in there, and they would actually, whatever, we didn't know what it was at the time, but it was ripping off the top of our freezer and just taking most of the deer venison. Um, and that was really my first sighting at a young age in Texas. Um, my next sighting which was probably one of, well, the longest sighting and probably one of the scarier sightings was my dad was a police officer in San Antonio, Texas, and he decided to take a job outside of being a police officer. So he was offered a job in Possum Kingdom, Texas. That's about two and a half hours north uh, west of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of Possum Kingdom, Texas, but it's a uh, 1600 acre uh, uh, basically state park and uh, they have three sections of camping. Um, my dad took a job as a the head warden there and also game warden for the three counties and was an arch of the county which was a pretty big county. Uh, from the main road you're looking at 30 miles just to get to the state park. I mean it was in the sticks. Uh, nothing but large big large ranches surround the 1600 acre state park um th where so you kind of get an idea where uh i lived on the main peninsula of the park there for the game warden and the uh, head ranger they had a special housing area for for the uh game warden there and the and we were housed there with my family it was right on the water there waterfront um there was large, very large herds of white-tailed deer that would gather there during the winter months. Uh, people used to feed them year-round, so it was nothing to have 30 to 50 white-tailed deer, you know, that would pile up together at all times. One, uh, I guess it was in, oh, I think it was in January, um, we, would, we had it in front of our house about 200 yards down, we had a floating pier 
dock that would go across a cove. If you kind of picture that, the cove, um, the floating pier was on one side of the cove. You could enter the pier, and then it stretched all the way across the cove to the other side of the cove. So you could either enter both ways. Well, the crappie fishing was good at night, uh, like 2 a.m. in the morning. And my mother, I asked her if I could go out late that night. She was the night owl, and I wanted to go fishing because the fish the crappie didn't bite until around 2 a.m. in the morning. So that night she said, you know, fine, be careful, and, you know, and uh, go out there for a couple hours and don't freeze. It was cold that night. I remember it was a full moon. Um, I was out there no more than about 30 minutes. Uh, it, so kind of paint a picture there. We had a full moon night, and then they had like, I guess you would call it like stadium lights almost, if you would call it, two of them that would lit up the pier, the surrounding area, and the water for safety reasons, of course. And it was pretty bright that night with the moonlight and the actual lighting. I was there fishing. Um, all of a sudden, I heard just a ruckus. Just the whole woods on both sides of the cove were just lighting up. There was deer running everywhere. They were coming out of the woods. They were so scared that they were jumping in the water and actually swimming from one side of the cove to the other. I found that very odd because normally deer don't like to get in the water unless you're just, you know, forced to get in the water or they're traveling from one island to another or something like that. So upon seeing the deer run into the water and hearing the splashing, I saw something running, like corralling the deer from that came out of the uh, woodside coming towards the um, pier. Well, I, I dropped my pole and I looked and it was this huge upright figure. And it was in the dark, but it was coming closer and closer into the light. Now, you got to remember there was a moonlight night that night. So it started out as like seeing a silhouette. Then as it got closer into the stadium lights, it, it would, you know, you could actually make out more of the body, uh, what it looked like, everything else. Well, as it was hurting the deer, it grabbed two of the deer that were in the, the end of the, I guess it was the, the end of the herd and he grabbed one of them and he picked it up from the rear this creature and it broke both back legs at the same time you could hear snapping like bones just pop pop and it was very loud um and at the point when he snapped the legs you could hear the deer actually making this horrible bleeding noise just um i don't know I, i'm not going to try to to you know copy what it was doing but it was just an awful a terrible uh, bleeding noise from the deer. And then after he broke the legs, he dropped it on the ground and the deer was trying to use his front legs to pull himself forward, but never got too far. After he dropped the deer and it was kind of immobile, he left and kept on chasing the deer. But when he broke the legs, he also made a whistling noise. Uh, it was very loud. I remember thinking, why is this? First of all, I was trying to take in what I'm seeing, what it was actually doing, you know, and it, I couldn't, I don't know. I just didn't, I was trying to put a round peg in a square hole. You know, I just could not figure out what these things were. Now, obviously they were upright. They were huge. Um, I would say height wise between seven and a half, eight foot tall. Um, just wide as a wider, maybe, Two football, if you, you know, pick any lineman on a pro football team and put them together, you're probably looking at the width of this this creature. Um, he made a whistling noise at the point when he dropped the deer. Then I heard an immediate whistle back from his first whistle. And I didn't see anything, um, but the deer were still, you know, hurting, trying not to go in the water. Out the corner of my eye, I see another creature come out from the other side, and he was trying to stop the deer from the front. So you got one of the back who's already killed one, or at least injured it. You got another one who's corralling them, trying to get them towards, you know, together. But they're going in the water. So it was just a ruckus of, it was just crazy. It really was. Now, I didn't see the second creature catch anything. He was just kind of carousing him, holding his arms kind of out, and the deer were turning. Um, I was noticing most of I was had my eyes focused on the biggest one. The second one that came up to the whistle was smaller. I would say it was probably only seven foot, 
and it wasn't as wide, um, quite as wide as the first one. Um, and uh, he never picked up a deer that I could see. He didn't catch anything. But by the time I focused back on the other one, he disappeared. He walked off. I guess he just went and tilted her back into the dark of the woods, and that was it. Um, after this, the first one, I guess he figured he not going to catch any more deer. They got what they were going to what they came for, what they could catch. He turned around. He looked at the pier at me for a few minutes. I, I wasn't seen like a few minutes. It was co- obviously just a couple seconds. He turned around, walked over to the deer that he broke the back legs on with one scoop of his arm, picked it up. And I'm assuming it broke his neck because it was making this terrible bleeding noise. And then when he scooped it up and put his hands around what looked like around the neck area, it stopped. I mean, all noise ceased. It was it was quiet. After that, he put the deer under his underarm and just turned around and walked right back in the woods. So that was my second Saturday in there at Possum Kingdom Lake. And after that, that night, I was so scared. I gathered my fishing pole, um, all my, my fishing gear, and literally ran off the pier uh, back to my house. Uh, I ran in the door. My mother was like, what's wrong? You look white as a ghost and calm down. And I, I couldn't talk. I mean, I was just stuttering. I was 15 at the time, by the way. So, you know, a young man at 15 seeing something like this, I was just uh, in awe. You know, I, I told my mom what I saw. She sat me down and she said, son, we had a lot of mountain lions there on the state park, too. Um, and so everybody saw the mountain lions from time to time. So she said, well, it was probably mountain lions, you know. You can talk to your dad about it tomorrow. Uh, you didn't wake this man up. Once he went to bed at nine o'clock, I mean, the house had to be on fire to, to wake this man up. So it wasn't going to happen that night. Um, I talked to him the following morning, explained to him what I saw. He just said, son, he said, we'll talk about this at a later time. He said, right now we're going to keep it between me and you and your mom. We're not going to say anything to anybody else. If you do, they're going to think you're crazy and we're just going to leave it at that. We're not going to, I'll talk to you at a later date about this when I feel you're ready. And that was pretty much said. what he said was law at that time. So I didn't say anything else. Um, about a year later, he told me of uh, uh, some sightings that he had on the park. Um, you know, and he said, I believe what you said. He said, but there's not going to be, anybody besides your family that are going to pretty much believe what you saw. So he said, it's best to keep, you know, what you've seen and everything to yourself. Um, and I did, uh, we had some other helpers that there were ranger twos and stuff that worked on the, uh, park there. And one night I kind of let it slip and I talked to one of the other helpers there on the, on the park and he just said, look, Ed, uh, you know, that was my dad's name. And he said, you know, he, he, he gets from time to time people that come and bring uh, sightings to the office there. And we have to basically write up a report. Once we get them, these reports written up, we put them in a file. And then we call up to Austin where the main Parks and Wildlife is. We have to hand them over to a gentleman that deals with these type of sightings and then that it's, it's hush, hush, no, nothing else said, you know, that's it. Uh, we, we pretty much file them this way to this gentleman. Nothing else has ever said or done. So I, apparently these government people in, in the parks and wildlife from after talking to my dad, they know about these things that are happening in our parks and wildlife systems. Uh, people are seeing these on, you know, a yearly basis and they're turning in reports. It's just, they're not doing a whole lot about it from what I understand. Now I don't know for sure what's going on at the Austin level, but that's what I've you know heard from the few people that I've talked to about this in my family. So, you know, that's, that's about all I can tell you there, uh, you know, as far as that sighting goes. Um, we'll go on to, I guess, sighting number three. This happened uh, in Colorado Tech, uh, Colorado, I'm sorry, Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And that's uh, in Archuleta uh, County, uh, Colorado. It's on the San Juan National uh, Reserve. Um, 
it's a very large wilderness area up there. Uh, we were on an eight day hunt. Uh, we got drawn for first rifle season up there. Uh, there was four guys, me and three other hunters that were uh, camping together. Uh, the first day we got there, we went and applied for a bear tag, an elk tag, and a mule deer buck tag. That's what I had, and that's what most of the other guys had picked up. Um, the first we got in, set up our camp the first day, got everything out. Uh, we were going to proceed to hunt that following morning, which we did. Uh, I am always one that believes, and if you're going to kill something, you got to work for it. So I was the one that always backed up, backpacked in two or three or four miles, the farthest distance I could get away from the other hunters. I always had better success. Uh, it took a little more work and I'd have to leave usually before daylight. You know, I'd leave a couple hours before daylight and, you know, have to travel through the, through the woods at night and get to my spot before you know, daybreak. So I would have a good hunt. So it was pretty, pretty spooky, but I always seemed to make it okay. Um, that morning I left early. Uh, I got to my, my, my spot before uh, daybreak set up. Uh, I had shot at opening about 30 minutes after daylight. I had shot a nice mule deer uh, buck. I went over there, made sure it was expired. I went ahead and, uh, clean the animal, gutted it. Uh, at that point, we had to backpack it out because there's no way you could carry the whole carcass out. So we had to cut it up in quarters and put it in my backpack to carry it out. So I left behind uh, a pile of guts, um, the, uh, of course, the carcass and uh, the skin behind because that was just something you left behind. You carried out all kind of, whatever kind of boned meat you could carry out in your pack. So I carried it out. It took about an hour and a half, two hours to get all the bone meat out. Took two trips. I got back to the main road and got back to camp. Uh, told the guys, showed them, you know, the horns and everything. We talked about it. And I decided I wanted to go back that following evening and hunt and try to fill my elk or bear tag. So uh, we spent a couple hours at camp got ready because we had to leave early of course just hike back out there a couple miles two or three miles we left back up got out there and i was going between the two canyons to get to the open meadow that i was going to hunt in and go ahead hello oh, did, did somebody, hello no I, I think you're okay there yeah oh okay i'm sorry thought somebody asked something uh i was walking back through the canyon trying to get to the meadow where i was going to hunt that evening and i was Pass right through where I had left the guts, the carcass, and the uh, bones. And I noticed they were all gone. Everything was gone. There was, you know, a little bit of fur there and the blood and everything else, but everything else was gone. And I said, I found that very odd, being I was only gone maybe three hours, four hours max between morning hunt and the evening hunt, getting ready to go into the evening hunt. So I didn't think anything of it. Um, I went on to go keep on going. I had about another whole couple hundred yards to get to where I was going to hunt, which was, uh, by the way, I found this, I found it a little odd. Uh, we got there that morning, uh, back up just a little bit. I, we got there that morning before the day hunt, we went out and did a little bit of scouting and I found this, um, I guess it was like a brush blind that was already made. Um, it was made out of fallen pine trees, uh, you know, they were broken. They were put into like a little teepee like structure almost. And I thought, man, this is be a great place. I don't have to build anything. I can just get in there and I can hunt the, because it overlooked that meadow. So I was like, you know, I'll just go ahead and use this as a deer barn. So that's what I was hunting out of when I shot that mule deer that morning. Well, I was going back to that same location to hunt in the evening when all that you know, everything, the carcass, the guts, and everything was gone. So I was going forward to get to that structure to hunt. And then all of a sudden I felt this, I don't know how to explain it other than fear, just fear like I've never felt before. It, it was almost like, it was like I was going to die. I felt like I, was, I couldn't breathe. I was getting sick to my stomach. Um, I froze in my tracks. I had um, 
my gun on my shoulders. I didn't have it uh, in my hand. I had, now you got to remember when I hunt, I wear total camouflage pants, camouflage shirt, camouflage gloves. And I also put on a camouflage head net to conceal my, my, my head and the whites of my face and everything. So I was totally camoed out. When I felt that fear, I just stopped. And I couldn't, make it, even if I wanted to, I couldn't have, you know, gone any further. I just was froze. And I couldn't, I just couldn't figure out why. So I looked around, I just, my heart was coming on my chest. And all of a sudden, I hear the snap crack in the bushes. And here come these two elk, uh, elk uh, females coming out of the bushes. And they almost ran me over. I mean, they were just full speed. And I took a big deep breath and I was like, man, that's what I'm afraid of. That's what I'm having all the fear about. It just didn't make sense. So I saw the elk blow past me, and the fear didn't leave. And I was looking at the direction the elk had gone right by me and kept on going. Well, as I turned back my head to the right to get back on the path, I mean, I looked right at this creature. We were no more than, I'd say, 30, 40 yards at the most, maybe probably 30 yards. And he was right at the edge of the of the the uh, wood line and he was right next to a tree and he was staring me down and we locked eyes. And now you got to remember, I had a, a, a head net on, so I don't think it could see my eyes through that head net. I mean, he might've, but I don't think so because it does conceal the face. So when we locked eyes, I just, almost lost my bowels. I'll be honest with you. I just felt like I was going to milk. Um, we were looking at each other and he, I mean, he had this look at him like he was trying to size me up. He was looking straight at me and he would go rock from one side to the other. And he would look at me. He rocked back to the other side and his posture would get, he almost was like blowing out his chest. And like if you puffing it out forward and he would put his arms kind of wide to the side and he kept puffing his chest out and he would go right and he would go left. And he kept looking like sizing me out or trying to figure out what I was. Well, it seemed like minutes. It was probably actually only eight, maybe eight to 10 seconds, 15 seconds at the very most, but it felt like forever. Um, so after he started puffing his chest out and everything and swaying back and forth from side to side, kind of looking at me, he kind of let his chest back down. You can see he kind of got a little more, com I guess, comfortable would be the word. I don't know, or just kind of quit puffing his chest out. And he made this like whoop noise, just whoop like this, turned around and bolted right back from where he came from. But he came out from the same direction as the elk females came out. So I'm assuming that I was in the you know wrong place at the wrong time. He was chasing the elk uh, deer, you know, out through that meadow, and I just happened to cross paths with him. That's the only thing I can think of at that time. But that was the closest I ever uh, had been to one of these creatures. I got a really good look at him, and like I said, it was a stare down for about you know eight to fifteen seconds. So you know that. That really, that messed with me. Um, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, you know, function. I really couldn't. After he left, I turned around and I literally ran between running and walking as fast as I could back all the way to camp. Um, I got back, the guys showed up that night and asked me, you know, why I didn't hunt. And I just told them, I said, I saw something out there, guys, I can't explain. Um, they said, well, tell us, what'd you see? And I, I told them what I saw. They started laughing at me, saying it was probably a bear standing up. I said, no, guys, you know how long I've been hunting, 40-plus years. You know how many bear I've killed? This was not a bear. I can tell you that. Well, of course, they kept mocking me and everything, and I just had enough. I just shut down after that period of time, and I didn't say any more. And they kind of, you know, let it lie, kind of poked at me, poked fun at me the rest of the night. But so it, I, I couldn't sleep that night. I had nightmares. Um, I didn't hunt for the next two days. We were there a total of, you know, got to be there for a total of eight days. We were only there the first day. 
so I, I didn't go hunting for two days. Um, then on the uh, fourth day, I decided to go back out for an evening hunt. I was like, well, you know, I have two tags left, a bear and an elk tag. And I said, I'm going to try a different area. You know, I thought if I went down two canyons over and got a little ways that I wouldn't see something like this again. Um, so I went out on the fourth day for an evening hunt and, uh, I ended up shooting a black bear that evening. Um, so I, I, we were only in the hunt about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, it was well before dark. I was hunting right next to a water hole, had the bear come down. I shot it twice. Um, I walked over to it to make sure it was dead. I took out my phone and took a picture of it. Uh, and then I decided, I figured it was around 300 pounds. It was a, uh, black bear. They don't get, but about, you know, two to 300 pounds most of the time there in Colorado. So I said, I need some help to get this thing out. Uh, so I went ahead and decided to mark the area with my GPS, go back out, get the guys when they got through hunting and have them come down there and help me carry this bear out. So I got back to camp. The guys got back. We went and got our flashlights spotlights and everything and decided to go back down and get the bear well when we got back down to the gps location i marked and it was right not too far off the pond we found nothing we i mean the bear was gone we found the blood where it was lying we found a little bit of hair from the bear but it was gone and i'm like how this bear was dead i mean i walked up to it put two rounds with a 30 odd six through it dead in the heart uh, in the lungs, this bear was expired when I left it. So I was like, what in the heck is going on? The guys were like, come on, Ed, what's going on? I was like, look, you saw the pictures, okay? We went back to my camera we, uh, phone. And I said, the pictures are there. You could see that same area that I shot the picture in and everything. And they, they couldn't explain it. So we started looking with the spotlights. And most of the area around there was pine needle flooring. flooring. There was heavy pine trees. So the flooring was pine needles. Well, we started looking around and we started seeing tracks from about the spot where the bear was all around the spot where the bear was. And then walking down this canyon, real steep Canyon. It went from, it turned from very thick pine trees to uh, rock canyons down there. And you, you really couldn't follow. It got way too steep for a man to, unless you had rope or some kind of climbing rope to get down there and follow. So we started looking at the tracks and I didn't have a tape measure, but I stuck the gun butt of my uh, gun to the tracks. And then we measured it when we got back up to the truck and had a measuring tape up there. And they were measuring between 17 and 17 and a half inches long. So, and I kept telling them, I said, and they said, Oh, it's probably a bear that drugged your other bear off. And I was like, guys, do you see any drag marks? There's no drag marks whatsoever. I said in these pine uh, needle floored, uh, you know, flooring they had in the woods there, you could drag your buddy your gun and you could see drag marks very easily. Um, so you, you didn't see any drag marks. Whatever carried that bear off, picked it up and walked off with it. No doubt in my mind. I mean, there just was nothing there to prove any anything else. So we followed the tracks down to the, to where the, they led down to that steep canyon and we just couldn't follow anymore. So we left it at that. So we went back to camp and I said, guys, I've had enough. I said, too many things have happened to me up here. I'm done. I still had three days to hunt. I got in my truck and drove all the way back to Texas. So I, that, I, I just had enough. So that's kind of, that's my third sighting. I have, one more, and this is kind of close to home and kind of close to heart here. In 2016, I will tell you kind of the location that uh, this is happening as you know, as of in the last two or three years, where it's happening. I, I don't want to give names of too close to where I live, but I will tell you that it's in Texas. It is along the Guadalupe River um, near Canyon Lake, Texas. There's a stretch along there that goes from uh, Canyon Lake all the way down to Seguin. It goes through New Braunfels, Texas, into Seguin. There's a stretch out there that I take my daughter fishing. She's uh, around 
10 or 11 at the time, I guess, when we uh, were on our excursion. It was back in 2016, and we had a little aluminum John boat, and I would take, we would dock in the Guadalupe River, we'd go down the river, and there was this creek that spurred off of the Guadalupe River, and it would go up about, I guess, three or 400 yards up the, the spur of the creek into a large ranch that was huge. And uh, we fished up in there because it was a, it would puddle up into these large ponds in there and the trees would overgrow and you didn't even hardly get any light in there because uh, there was so much tree overgrowth, but it was great fishing. And I love to take my, my grandkids and my daughter in there. So uh, one of my daughters, so that day we were, it was uh, around, I guess, around four, four thirty. We went up into the spur of the creek and uh, we got into the second pond area uh, and both sides, you have real thick bushes on both sides of the pond. So we were proceeding to make noise, you know, she was having fun catching the little brim there in the, in the pond and we were splashing water, you know, so there was nothing quiet about it. It was, it was um, a good time. Um, all of a sudden I was baiting her uh, hook was the worm on it and I got this feeling that I got when I was in Colorado it just came on me like I was but this time I felt like I was being watched but I got that same feeling where the hair stood up on my neck and I did not feel I just didn't feel safe it just it's just very eerie so I didn't say anything to my daughter and I started to look up and pan around the the pond and I couldn't see anything I, I just uh I couldn't figure it out. It was frustrating. So I was like, okay, I'm just getting this feeling and I don't know why, but I'll get back to doing what I'm doing. So she's, you know, dad, bait my hook, bait my hook. And let's get, you know, catch up the fish. And I was like, okay. So I started back baiting the hook again. Second time I got this feeling. So I said, all right. So I got her in the water. She was fishing and I started looking again. And all of a sudden I see this there's like these cedar trees that, that were on the right side of the bank. And I see this, oh, I see the cedar trees start to park right in front of me and start to park. And I see a face of the same creature, different in a few ways, the color of the skin, the uh, color of the, of the fur was a little different, but same, pretty much same facial features. Everything else was looking right at us. Um, I, I think I saw breast on this one because when she opened our, I'm gonna say she, when she opened up the cedar tree wide enough, you could see from her about her waist up, and I saw breast on this one, so I'm, I'm gonna call it a female. She didn't have that same look like I got from the the males that I saw in Colorado. I know definitely that was a male, no doubt. There was genitalia on this one. Uh, he was endowed. <laughs> so that's the only thing I could say. He was definitely a male. Um, this one, a female, uh, but she didn't have that look in her face of, I didn't get the fear. I was scared, no doubt, but I just didn't have that look of like she was sizing me up or anything was about to take place. It just didn't, I just didn't get that feeling, but it was still very, I was still very worried, you know, with a small child and on the water being only maybe 20 or 30 feet from it. So I didn't want to, I, I, we kept looking at each other for, you know, probably five to six, maybe a little longer seconds. Uh, time goes by very slow when these things happen. Um, they feel like forever, but they're, they're actually seconds. Then she let the, she just let the, the uh, cedar trees go back together at that point, I felt that I needed to get my daughter out of there. So I told my, you know, my my baby girl, I said, look, it's time to put the fishing equipment up. Daddy's not feeling good. We're going to go ahead and row back up and get to the truck. And she argued a little bit. Why? Why? And I was like, no, we, we just need to go. Daddy's not feeling good. So we loaded, you know, we loaded the the uh, fish that we had on the side in there and the uh, anchor and we started to slowly, uh, you know, paddle out of there. And that was the end of that sighting. Nothing ever, anything, nothing more took place at that, that, that area. And we did get back to the truck and everything was good, but I never shared it with her. She's, you know, a few years older now. And I, when I find the time down the road, I'll tell her, you know, about what took place, but right now is not the time or the age, I don't think for her. So that was my fourth sighting. 
you know, um, from talking to a few people, I've, you know, one thing I have heard is, and I've always asked myself, why did I have, why have I seen these things four different times? You know, because people are always asking, you know, I want to see them. I want to see them. I'll tell you what. Yes, they do. It is curious. You do have a curiosity after the fact of seeing these animals, these creatures, but there's a lot that comes with it too. I could never talk to anybody about these things. Um, I felt that uh, they were all going to think I was crazy. I've had a lot of nightmares, uh, a lot of um, fear that has gone with these. For a long time, I didn't hunt after the incident that I had uh, in, you know, up in um, Possum Kingdom. I didn't want to get out in the woods, uh, especially at night. I never went out. It took five, six years for me to ever actually go into the woods at night, and I didn't go very far, and I had a big spotlight with me. So it took all the fun out of uh, the woods for me. I mean, I lived in the woods from the time I was very young. So it, it, it took something so innocent and turned it into a fear of mine, really. That's the only thing I could say. Um, and so you got to be careful for what you wish for because sometimes there's a lot that goes with these sightings. It's just not seeing something, you know, that doesn't fit. You know, your your brain is trying to figure out how to categorize this creature, what you're seeing. So, you know, yeah, it's interesting to see them. It's something after the effect that you gives you curiosity and you want to know more, but there's a lot of, a lot of not so good things that come along with it too. So that's what I would want to tell people that sees it, that want to see it. If they're going out to try to find it, none of these, Time, all the times that I've ever, the four sightings that I've ever had, I never went looking for them. It was always going out, doing what I love, hunting or fishing, and being out in the woods and happened to come across them. So it was nothing like I've ever gone out to look for these animals, and I probably never will. Um, if there's a fifth sighting, it's going to be because I was out in the woods hunting or fishing. I'll probably tell you that. <laughs> Brand, Tom, I know you guys have lots of questions. I, I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Larry, uh, Larry, just to start off, because you had sightings in two different states, did they, yes, d- did the uh, Sasquatches look the same? I mean, I, besides height and width. You know, there were, I'll tell you that there was two different colors um, as far as skin goes. The one that I saw up in Colorado, it had, how do I say it, more of a gunmetal gray skin color, I guess like a gray mixed with a little bit of black in it. Um, the lips were dark color. They were very wide and they were thin and they were dark. Um, the one that I, that I've seen in Texas are more of a dark, dark tan. And then their lips around it are darker. Now the ones that I saw in Texas also were dirt. uh, I guess they had dirt on their face. They were I don't know how to say this. They weren't as kept, I guess, as I saw the ones, the ones in up at, or the one up in uh, Colorado. In fact, the one I will tell you, the one guy, the big guy that I saw in Colorado that day, he had a scar from his ear down to his chin. And I picked on that. I mean, that's the first thing that I saw besides, you know, seeing the actual, the actual creature itself. I, I honed in right on that huge scar that he had right there. But, yeah, there was a color difference between, and and like I said, size-wise, the Colorado creature was much, it was bigger and wider than the ones that I've seen in Texas. Wow. Hey, Larry. You know, so I'm just going to comment for for starters. Sure. I got to (laughs) say, you know, as much, these things are fascinating, but also I don't like them from the standpoint, uh, especially what you just said is, you know, as, as a hunter, you kill something immediately, and the fact that it grabs these deer and snaps their hind legs and lets them suffer in, you know, in obvious fear, you know, and panic. Uh, right. That's just a comment. That's all that I, you know, I just, that's something I wish they would just go and grab it and snap its neck and get it over with. Um, oh, I agree. That, that was something that really hit me hard at the time, but being a 15-year-old boy is seeing them. Uh, break the legs and basically just, you know, put them in a state of uh, suffering until they decide to go back 
and finish them off, you know, so they could pick up, I guess more, the only thing I could think of is to try to grab more deer. But yeah, that was as a 15 year old boy that really, you know, that didn't, didn't hit good with me. So, yeah, yeah no, that's very disturbing. Um, so, you know, this is something that I asked, uh, what you, what you said about the fear coming over here is, you know, we hear it a lot. And so I asked the people that tell me that what made, what makes you think, where do you think that fear comes from when you don't see it, you weren't expecting it, and yet this overwhelming, it's all, almost like a sense of dread just sort of saturates your your body. What what do you think right. is the source of it? Where do you think it comes from? I, You know, I've thought about that over the time because, you know, I've given it many years. I have to think of it, holding all these sightings in and never really being able to talk to other people. I've thought about that many times. And I, I don't know if it's your sixth sense that actually kicks in to fear or to something that, you know, that's there and you can't see it, or if it's actually something that these creatures are emitting. I don't know. I just know that out of all the sightings that I've had, except for the one there, uh, in Possum Kingdom up on the bridge because I was so far, you know, 50 yards, but I felt a little safer because I was on uh, a concrete pier, you know, and I, I could get away to the right where the other ones were so close and that fear was so real. You know, I, I really don't know. I don't know if it's a sixth sense or something that they project, but all I know that it, it disables you. It truly disables you. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, that's that's really strange. And you never really felt that that type of fear before? No, no, no. Uh, you know, I, I've been in the military. Uh, I did my time in the military. Um, you know, I, I've been in some stressful situations. Uh, I never had that type of fear. I just didn't because I felt in those other situations that I was in control. I had some kind of control. Okay. Over these sightings, I didn't have control. I felt that I did, didn't have control. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, Larry, since you had four different sightings, which of the which of them would you say you felt that most fear? I would have to say there was two only, and I'll explain the differences between the two. The one the most fear was in Colorado because I was so close. It was uh, he was showing his dominance by. I'm a big guy. I'm 290 pounds, six foot one. I played football all my life. Uh, I'm no, by no means a little guy. Um, this guy dwarfed me. He was showing his dominance by puffing out his chest, and he, he would expel air into his chest and just pop it out almost like a bullfrog. You know, he just popped that chest out, and then he would hang his arms to the side to make him look bigger. I guess he was already big enough. He didn't need to do that, but it just, that being so close and seeing the definition so well, the muscles in his legs, the muscles in his arms, the definition, the, the, the uh, I mean, you could see in the face it had the, he looked very weathered. He looked, he had, a, you know, lines, you know, going in his face and his forehead. They were very deep. I mean, just seeing all that definition and uh, his dominance that he was showing, that was, that was the scariest. I'll be honest with you. I, I when I say I lost it, I, I, I peed in my pants. <laughs> I'll just say it outright. And I've never done that in 50 years, except for maybe when I was a baby. <laughs> now, now, after so. the whole uh, bear incident, when you showed your, your buddies the picture and they saw that there were no drag marks, did they finally believe you about what you had previously seen? You know, those three guys, they did not. I think they wanted to believe me. I think because the group we had and we were younger, we were – you know, in our, uh, they were anywhere from 25 to, you know, me being in my early 40s. They just weren't going to let you know at that time. That wasn't a cool thing to, you know, to, you know, because they, everybody was rousting everybody and giving everybody, they were giving me a hard time. I think they saw that and they weren't going to say nothing. So, but I will tell you that one of the guys, a uh, real good friend of mine, uh, he came up to me about three years ago and we talked and he said, I believed you that day. I just wasn't going to let the other guys know. He said, I obviously saw the pictures of the bear, went down with you to see where that bear was laying and to see that there was no drag marks, no way that that bear, a 300 pound bear could just disappear. I knew something was up and I was scared. He said, just seeing those tracks and being that, seeing that bear gone, 
I, I was on high alert, but he says I wasn't going to let anybody else know. So, yeah, I, I think everybody kind of knew it, but they just weren't going to let anybody know. Ryan, that was an excellent question. I, I was kind of thinking the same thing. You know, what did these – come on, guys. You know, what do you think? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I'm glad that at least one of the guys later said, yeah. 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 It made me feel better, too. And I obviously – I think I felt that, too. While I was there, I just think that they just weren't going to let it out. But I'm glad he did come out. And we've talked about it since. He's been the only one besides y'all that I've really – this has been good for me because I'm able to release something that I've wanted to talk to for a long time. I've given a few family members bits and pieces, but I've never told my all my story, all the sightings that I've had, the stories I've had during these sightings in depth like this. This is the first time, and I'm telling you, it feels like – uh, lead weight, lead weight jacket has been lifted off me. Yeah. So. Is your dad still around? Yes, he is, and uh, yes, he is. He's retired, uh, and we we we've had some good talks about it. And uh, he he he's had his sightings. I don't know if I I didn't discuss any of any of his sightings, but he let me know about the two sightings that he had while he was working on the park. And so yeah, he uh, he said, look, son, you know. Uh, they're real. They're there. The government knows about them. And we had to file these, like I was telling you earlier, had to file these reports. I never heard back, but we were always told that if somebody came in, have them fill out the report, find out where it was located, and then get the report to these people in Austin. So, Yeah, you know, it's funny because it's starting to feel more and more like it's an open secret, both with right. With governments, both at the federal level and also, you know, trickle down to the state, state, state and local yeah. guys. And because uh, I've heard that, and, you know, I've had some of them tell me that. And so it feels like there's almost a groundswell of it's just sort of slowly starting to creep out that, yeah, these things are out there. Right. And that's that's what my dad was kind of conveying to me. And, you know, like we talked, I said, you know, they, it's their responsibility to really let these people know that are going out into the woods. You know, they're using these state parks that are uh, going out on these public hunting lands. They need to know about the existence of these creatures because they're real. And people, you know, I'm not a real techie guy, and I haven't gone online that much. I don't, you know, I, I, I spend most of my time with my grandchildren and my children and the outdoors. So, I don't spend a lot of time online, but I did look a little bit after talking to uh, Joe and everything online. And, you know, these people need to be made aware. There's a lot of things going on with disappearances and stuff like that in our public lands and our state lands. And I'm sure not all of them, you know, will boil down to something like this. But I can tell you that they just people need to know whether they need to carry a weapon out there you know in the woods when they go out or whether they need to protect themselves and know these things are out there it's just the government needs to stand up and you know let these people know i mean you know because i'm sure there's been some you know from what i can read and see there have been some accents out there and i'm sure these creatures are to blame you know it's funny um i agree totally i i also think it's just my own personal opinion. I don't know how anybody else feels about this, but I suspect that, you know, the government is kind of between a rock and a hard spot with these things. And I've yes. often wondered if if there couldn't be some, and this is where I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth and some people are going to agree with this, you know, in the audience, but to create some legislation that would exempt a Sasquatch creature, a North American ape of any kind, from any of the existing environmental protection laws, so that um, you know, if, if, so that if they're and maybe maybe put a deadline on, you know, give it a 25 or a 50 year period to study these things, so that we don't get special interest groups going out and wrapping up, you know, entire sections of national forests and and you know public lands basically, just. Mm-hmm tying them up and um, because frankly you, you've got to use the resources to you know we need law enforcement out there we need rangers we need management of these systems and you got to pay for it it's got to come from somewhere so if you button it up tight and there's no 
harvesting of any, you know, responsible harvesting of natural resources, then you don't have the res- you don't have the funding to protect the lands. And ultimately, I, I think there's a real possibility that you would, you know, by doing that, it would actually be counterproductive. It would do the exact opposite of what these people or what some of those protection laws, you know, would, would do. Uh, mm-hmm. It would allow illegal extraction. You know, if you don't if you don't have a law enforcement out there, you're going to have illegal extraction of resources. Um, that's just that's a thought, I guess, maybe an opinion. Um but going back to Colorado, you were wearing like a ghillie suit or some sort of a full camel with the netting and all that? Well, basically, yeah, I guess you could say that I was totally concealed in camouflage. I had camouflage pants on. I had the camouflage uh, button suit. And then I had uh, camouflage gloves on and a camouflage head net. It's kind of a like a see-through net netting, a thicker netting that you put on a conceals over. In other words, you can see through the netting to the oh, holes yeah. in the netting, but there's not big cutout areas, you know? Yeah. So, no, I yeah. Don't, so basically a hundred percent camouflage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, I think, you know, it sounds like that kind of stumped the, the Bigfoot. And I like that. I thought that was pretty awesome. Um, That's it, what I came across. That's what came across to me. He was looking at me to me. That kind of felt like what, what am I looking at? Along with the aggression, what am I looking at? You know? Yeah. yeah. Do you do you use scent also to, uh, you know, the spray, the drops that you put on your boots and stuff? Or? Uh, uh, I don't use, a lot of guys use the tarsal scents, you know, from the glands and stuff like that. I'm not a real big fan up there for for elk and stuff during the rutting season, but I did use uh, scent away, which is uh, like a, uh, you spray it on your boots and your, your clothes and everything, and it takes the scent out of your clothes. Yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Larry, uh, go back to your mom for a second, because you said that she, she didn't believe you for the first sighting, but have you talked to her since, or you and your dad have, or do you think? Yeah. That maybe- yeah. Okay. Go. Cool. Yes, and and, and if, if if we got time, I, I can tell you just a short rundown of, of their sighting together. That when my I told you my dad had two sightings. One of the sightings was with her. Um, basically, during the winter, um, they closed the section. There's three sections of the park there, and they closed the two uh, deepest ones that they're the farthest back. They closed them off and closed the gates. So my dad likes to take walks in the evening with my mom. And they go back into these, you know, the ones that are closed back there and walk back in there. Well, during the winter month, they were back there walking and um, they, a rock came just straight over the cedar trees and fell right there on the, uh, the gravel path, walking path they were on. And so my dad stopped and he said, hey, he said, who's throwing rocks back here? You're not supposed to be back here. This area is closed. And that he said at that time he knew there was only two campers in the whole park and they were at the very front and they were elderly uh, folk and they're, they're not going to be in that back area in the woods. So he knew that, you know, where's this coming from? And you, I mean, from the park, it takes 30 or 40 miles from the main road to get in there. And they're all huge ranches. There's nobody going to be in that's going to walk in. So he couldn't figure out where these rocks were coming in. So the first one came, they started walking a little further. The second one came and almost hit my dad in the head. So he said, mom, you know, let's get out of here. You know, something's not right. He started, he said he got that feeling that I was getting, you know, that kind of scared feeling. Uh, he was getting, you know, uneasy feeling and he felt that he needed to get my mother out of there. Well, they turned around and when he turned around, he said all of a sudden he didn't see nothing, but the cedar trees just started parting and it sounded like a locomotive was just tearing up through that uh, cedar trees. And uh, he went back that next day and he uh, looked there and he said, you could just see where this something huge just plowed through the trees, knocking them over, breaking branches. It looked like a little tornado went through there, you know? And he said, uh, so that was, that was his first sighting. Uh, he didn't actually see the, the creature, but everything, you know, led up to it. And then, uh, the second one was on horseback. We had to look over a bunch of longhorn cattle for the state up there. And, uh, it ran about, uh, 30 yards across a trail right in front of them while he was on horseback and he got a pretty good look at him. And that was his first visual sighting. And so that's those two incidents is what he came to me later and said, you know, I, you know, so my mother knew something when she didn't see it, but she knew something was out there that shouldn't have been. And, 
you just not, you know, something doesn't throw rocks at you. Deer, bear, <laughs> they're not going to throw rocks at you. So, yeah. So after that, she came to me and she said, I'm sorry, you know, that I didn't believe you and said they were mountain lions. But she said, you know, between me and you, I'm a believer now. So, <laughs> you know, I apologize. I was like, that's all right, Mom. Yeah, that, that so, first sighting was when you were five and your next sighting yeah. was uh, when you were 15. Was there any attention, yeah. any time during that? 10 year period when you thought, well, you know, I was only five years old. Maybe I really did see a bear. Maybe my mom was right. You know, I, no, because even at five, I can't tell you, you know, at 50 years old right now, I couldn't give you details, but I still, even at five years old, cause I was having a lot of nightmares. My mom didn't quite understand why, but after I had those, uh, that sighting with my mom, for almost three months, I had terrible, I, I would not sleep in my bed. I was one of those ones that slept in my bed. I didn't want to be in my mom's room. I was pretty independent. But after those, uh, after that, that sighting I had, I would not sleep in bed with myself. I was with my parents. I was having a terrible nightmare for about three months. So she knew something was wrong. She just couldn't put a finger on it, you know. So, uh, yeah. No, I, I still remember seeing... That, I mean, it was a huge, what I thought was a hairy man. So, you know, you know, bear was definitely out of the question because it, it looked too much between like an ape and a man to me, even at five years old. You know, I couldn't figure out, you know, that even that age, it wasn't a bear for sure. So I, mm -hmm. I pretty much knew that what I saw. You know, in fact, I, I drew, I, I, at, at, when I first went into first grade at six years old, I think it was, I had drew, I was drawing pictures of the hairy man, and my mom, the the teacher, was sending these these little crayon pictures of the hairy man. And she was asking, they asked, well, what why does he keep drawing these pictures at school? And my mom said, the only thing I could ever think of is when we were hunting, he kept saying that he was seeing a hairy man, you know, from the deer stand that we are the brush blind we were in, and so uh, that's what the, you know. There was the reason I kept drawing those you know pictures at that age. So. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so even your teacher yeah. noticed, caught her attention. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Yeah. Right. You know, I got a question on that. The one when you're 15, mm -hmm. and um, you know, by the by the pond, or I guess that was a pond or a lake or something. It was a, no. It was actually a lake, and it had a cove that went back into the uh, skinny cove, and there was a, a the pier went across from one side to the other of the cove. Oh, oh, okay. All right. So that's a, so when and you saw these things, you physically saw them moving and running or doing whatever. Yes. Okay. So what I've read is that some people have described, you know, you get this massive, huge beast, you know, what, anywhere from seven to nine foot tall. It sounds like you had one that was big and one that was smaller. But they mm -hmm. heard one guy describe their movement. What he really, what it really reminded him of, was field mice. You know, here's this huge ape, but the movements are so rapid, just snap, 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 that it reminded him of field mice. That furtive, darting movement. Um, mm -hmm. Would you? Do you think there was any? Did you see any of that? That's what I'm wondering. I'll be honest with you, though. I can see where he was coming from that, but I, my experience was that they, I thought they were, they were moving so gracefully, it almost looked like they were floating. You know, I mean, it was so graceful. They were so fast for something so big. I mean, when he grabbed that deer, it was, you know, and I, I, I asked myself, because when I first saw him, it was more into the dark coming into the light of those big stadium lights that were up there. When he grabbed those legs, you know, I don't know if he lunged forward or he almost jumped, but he was on that deer. It seemed like he was right behind the deer. Then all of a sudden, within a second, he was on that deer breaking his legs. I mean, it was that fast and it was that smooth. I mean, it was just like a well oiled machine. It was just really, really different. So, yeah, they're very graceful for being something so big. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that's so surprising is, uh, <laughs> they're they're very well honed is what it sounds like they're muscular yes yeah. yes yes definitely yes um so maybe another question i had was you know the one in colorado the the where the two elk went zipping back past you 
Um, yes. Was there any water nearby, like a lake or? No, there was a, a small pond. They, they see uh, that time of the year was a. They had a pretty good drought the year before, so they had been putting a bunch of the rancher was putting a bunch of small ponds around, and I think they were filling them up just to make sure that so the wildlife had some drinking areas to come to. So where I was hunting from, um, it was a canyon that went into a huge that turned into a big meadow, and then on the left side of the meadow was a small pond. And it was, it was, you know, when I say pond, it was more like a tank, you know, just a small water hole. Sure, sure. So, yeah. so it's out of the four sightings, did any of them, were any of them not near a water source, like a stream or pond or lake or something? Let me see. You know, the, 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 the only one that, the, that I could say would be, now, and we had water there too, but we had it in troughs. We had uh, cattle on it. So we had those big feeding troughs, you know, and we would keep those filled with water. Uh, there was about four or five of them on the ranch. So, no, there was no stand, uh, as far as uh, water holes or anything, but there was standing water in those troughs. And that was on my, my grandpa's ranch when I was five years old and had that sighting. But, yeah, if you really think about it, I mean, whether it would be standing water or physical water, yeah, all four sightings. I never really thought about that, but all four sightings of them had water within, you know, walking distance. Well, the reason I ask is it seems like that seems to be kind of a common thread amongst a lot of the sightings that these things are usually near some sort of a water water source. Whether they need it, or they're using it as... You know, I'm sure they need it themselves, but, you know, maybe they're using it as a, hey, let's wait till something goes to get a drink, and then we got it. Yeah, that's a right. source of food. Right. Now, yeah, Larry, because that's what I need. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask on, on a note of, um, speaking of water, and that second sighting, when after it broke the deer's legs, and the other deer you said huh? were basically went into the water and were swimming, did that, that creature go into the water as well you know you, you mentioned that it whistled but did it yes, actually it, yeah no no it never went in the water and I, and and because the deer had gone and like i said it was a cove so they went into the water swam and then got back up on the other side and ran out but i and i'll tell you why i don't think that they followed the deer because most of the deer went in the water i mean it was just like a free-for-all splash you know but because the stadium lights were so bright, it seemed like the second one that was coming out wouldn't go into that. There was like two rings. They had the moon that was lighting up the area, but then you had the big stadium lights that really pounced down a lot of light. And if you walked too far into there, you were in the right and center stage, you know, like Friday night lights, you know, on you. And it didn't like that. It didn't want to go it, come full swing into that light. And, I, and all the deer were going in, into that area, into the water. And so the more you went into the water, the more lights were there. So I think that it, that's one of the reasons why that second one backed out. They just didn't want to be in that bright light. So they kind of avoid um, the bright light. I think so. I think so. Will, can I, can I ask a question? It's sort of a follow-up to that. And that is, I've heard, I just want your opinion, if I can bring you into this a little bit, that... People have said that, I've heard it said that one of the deterrents, possible deterrents at nighttime would be an extremely bright, like 15 to 1700 lumen uh, flashlight. They come at you just you know, zap in the face with this. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or I, I don't know so much it'd be the flashlight, it's just the proximity to humans. You know, they associate those kinds of things with humans, which is a deterrent in itself. Okay. So in yeah, that so in that case, when it was coming into the stadium light or not wanting to, they knew humans were close by. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense because, like I said, you know, I wish I would have never took my eyes, but it was so much going on. You had one creature, you had two, you had all the deer going every direction like a bunch of rats. You know, so there was so much going on that I couldn't keep my focus on really one thing too long. Um, but yeah, I wish I would have saw it because it, actually the one to the left was closest to me, you know, the second one. 
How far did you have to run, you know, to get back to your house? I'm just curious about. Yeah, well, like I said, the cove was. It, it, you had that pier, the the floating bridge that went from one side of the cove to the other. So that an entrance, you can enter from either side. So my house was on the right side of it, and it was only a hundred yard. My my parents could actually, if they were looking out the window, could see that pier down there. You know, it was only about a hundred yards. So I I took you know, and ran as fast as I could and broke through the front the back door actually. I'd be doing mock two. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, I was I was lighting it up. <laughs> so yeah, getting back to that water, you know, you were saying the water, you know, and more and more I think about that. You know, we use I, I killed the bear that fourth day at the water hole. Whenever I go elk hunting, I hunt water, especially because there's not a lot of water out in the areas we were, you know, and that's why they make those water holes. So that makes a lot of sense that these creatures would use these water holes too to benefit them on a hunt, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Especially in a time of drought. Those drought. Yes. Would be a real commodity. Yeah. yeah and that's Texas, where all your games are coming to. Yeah. What was that, Brian? Oh, I just said, yeah, in Texas for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, that's where the animals are going to congregate. Oh yeah. Well, fellas, any more questions or final thoughts? We're, we're kind of getting short on time. Uh, no, I was just going to ask Larry if he had any questions for you while we have a couple of minutes. Or, sure. Well, yeah, the only, quick, the only question I had is if I, of course, I'm, I'm going to continue to go out in the woods. I, I'm not going to let this deter me. I'm 50 years old. I love the outdoors. So I'm going to continue to go. Is there anything, you know, guy, I don't know if I want to have another sighting, but if something, you know, if I was to come across another one, is there anything, one thing that you would say not to do to cause these things to be aggressive? You know, I haven't had any, besides the one in Colorado where he was challenging me, seemed to be, um, and I had the gun shouldered, I didn't have it in my hands, you know. Is there anything, one thing you could say not to do to cause these? Because that's the last thing I want to do is cause an aggressive reaction with these things. Well, typically when there's an aggressive behavior, number one, either they're coming after you as a food source or uh, it's an interaction, you know, you know like when you were uh, perceived in competition with the elk when that one, mm -hmm. you know, did the challenge with you there, the dominance thing. Um, I'll send you some pictures of markings. If you see those markings, just okay. back out of the area and stay stay out of that area. Uh, otherwise, okay. there really isn't a whole lot you can do in terms of their behavior. Uh, you can stand your ground. Don't ever run from one because okay. that's that can be a bad thing. Um, They're kind of like brave. Yeah, yeah you, you can bluff them. Uh, things like talking out loud like you're talking to other people close by, that messes with them. Um, and, and there's some other things. I'll send you some other methods that'll that can keep you protected. Uh, there's no sense in you not hunting. Uh, it's just being like you know with other animals, other predators being smart out in the woods. Right, being educated. Yeah, exactly, definitely. exactly. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Brian, Tom, anything further? No, I just want to say, Larry, that was an amazing story, amazing four stories. Yeah. And uh, very good and, and uh, um, great questions. Uh, Brian, you you had a lot of the questions that I had, so very good. Yeah, Larry, thank, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you all for having me. It's been a big, big weight off my shoulders, and you all have been great just listening to me. So thank you all again. I appreciate it. Larry, yeah, we certainly appreciate it. And our listeners will also, because we always get many listeners who will never talk about what happened to them. And, and it helps them feel a weight off their shoulders also when, when people like you talk about the things that you've, you've experienced. Great. That sounds wonderful. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes
open now.